Donald, um, who's an amazing woman, a real kind of ambassador for women in science. And um, I also went back to one of my own in invented characters from a previous book, a St. Kethy character called Corazay. And I told some of her story in a book of mine called Brinkmanship. I came back to her story and was able to use her again as a lead character. Um, I'm, I think we're given sort of very, my, my brief for The Missing, which was my last book, was just um, our theme this year is the year of exploration. Um, and I knew it was DS9 books, so it had to be there. And you've got certain constraints in that the characters in the, the books are, are at a certain point in the book narrative. But really I was able to go wherever I wanted. I think the only thing I had was, uh, could you put Prussia in a certain place at the end? Because that's where the next guy wants her to pick up his book. But it really was a as, as, as sort of little direction of that. It was up to me what I wanted to do with this book. And, um, and I, I, I went for it, yeah. Yeah, we do get quite a, a good degree of freedom. I think one of the things that uh, Pockets Editorial have done is that they've made sure that everybody who writes for the series already understands what the larger edges of the box are. Like, we wouldn't be writing Star Trek novels if we didn't already have that. So we know that we can't go... We, we already inherently know what's too far. So we would never sort of say, I'm going to do this crazy thing, it's going to go way off the map, and then have them say, no, 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 pull it back in. So we, we understand the direction we have to go in, and we understand that, especially with the books now, is that you have to, like, as Una was saying, set, set up stuff for the other guys, so you can't say, I'm going to kill off this character, or I'm going to ca cause a major reveal, which the next writer's going, well, oh, come on, you know, I wanted to do this thing. So we try to make sure that we, we connect everything up. I mean, I, I've created uh, a lot of new characters, just for the, the, the Titan novel that I've just done, uh, introduce, I've introduced a brand new crew member character to, um, to Titan, just because I thought it would be fun and because uh, I've just killed somebody off. I killed off a main character. I thought, right, I need a replacement for that character. I thought, I'll oh, just create somebody completely new. Uh, and, and that was fun, um, just coming up with a uh, background for it. Do you remember the episode North Star from Enterprise, the planet of the cowboys? I was like, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a cowboy. I'm gonna put a cowboy in it. So I got a guy from that planet and put him in the, put him in the story because I just thought that would be kind of fun. Um, I put loads of uh, radical 70s feminists in my books. So. <laughs> the, the, just recently in, in, um, in uh, Poison Chalice, I got to create a, a, an entirely new crew uh, and an entirely new ship, which was the, the USS Lionheart, which was, um, you know, we were talking about audio drama stuff early, earlier. Um, many years ago, when I was working with Big Finish on Doctor Who, Gary Russell, who now no longer is part of the team, but was a producer, Gary's a huge Star Trek fan, and we had this blue sky conversation about what would Big Finish do if we could do a Big Finish Star Trek audio drama. And we had this idea about this crew of a small little medical cruiser that would fly around doing, and we, we would do like ER in space. And I never forgot the idea that I put down for that. And so that crew, the Lionheart, is the crew from that Never Made Big Finish series, where the, uh, the ship's doctor is a tree, and we've got like, uh, we had uh, a Bajoran, I think the, the Helms officer was a Bajoran. We've got, um, a Magna Roman, that's from you remember the, the, the uh, who actually speaks like the characters from Spartacus. You know, if you ever saw that show, where they have that very clipped dialogue. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a Roman first officer, yeah. um, and I think we had uh, uh, and a lot of women actually on that show. There's a, we had a female Muslim um, chief engineer. There was a, a that, was, that was really fun actually. I was designing the character, and there were some fans online on Tumblr who were talking about. Uh, Starfleet issue hijabs. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I've just written that, and it was just like, oh, that's so cool. That's you know? really brilliant. That was really great. That's a, it's such a fantastic thing where you can do that. You I'm going to nick that from an expert. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we would, yeah, because they'd obviously they'd be all different colours for the, yeah, yeah. the, the mm. departments. So, um, but creating that kind of stuff out of whole cloth, and then like, you know, connecting it to the larger Star Trek universe, that's really really cool. Because I mean, I've said this often before. Star Trek is something that's given me a lot of pleasure and has also been great in my personal life and in my private life and in my professional life. I've, I've got a lot out of it and I feel like when I'm creating a new bit of story, I'm kind of adding a little bit to that world and it's always really nice to see that kind of come to fruition. Any more questions from the audience at all? Here we go. I, um, I read a lot of uh, harder sci-fi and uh, fantasy books. Um, which of your books would be the best entry point into um, into the franchise books that you write? Um, with Albert, I, you probably wouldn't go wrong with a fall. Actually, I think that's a, that's a five book series that we did um, us two and three other Trek authors. It's called Star Trek: The Fall, 
um, we all took one uh, we all had one book and we all had sort of one ship and one captain didn't we the reason it's called the fall is that we uh, we were approached by the editor and she said oh, I want to talk to you about the fall series uh, um, um, we were Brits and we thought that was the title of the series. Actually, she meant the books that were coming out in the autumn. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. why it's called The Fall. It's that we would be, oh, Afterwards, he was like, yeah, that's a pretty good title. That's actually pretty good. Let's just call it that, yeah. So um, I, I think that might be a quite, quite a good point. It's, it's sort of, um, it's a culmination of a lot of storylines. Um, but I, I think it's, a, it's like a sort of reset for the universe, isn't it? Um, so that's where I'd come in. Um, my books tend to be quite standalone. So things like, if you know Deep Space Nine quite well, I think my book Hollow Men, if you know In the Pale Moonlight, you could read that. Um, if you know the story of the Dominion War pretty well, you could read Never Ending Sacrifice because it's the Cardassian side of what's going on. So uh, my Cardassian books are quite standalone, but I think The Fall is a good place to come in. I mean, in terms of hard SF, Star Trek's not hard SF. Never, you know, it's yeah, pretty, I'm not hard SF at all. So. It, it's, you know, it's pretty loose elastic sci-fi, yeah. you know, and, and uh, you know, going and expecting that. Having said that, I think s some of us who, who write for the series have tried to add uh, a layer of, of sort of scientific action. Chris Bennett, Christopher L. Bennett, um, yeah. uh, frequently to distraction, will put in just tons and tons and tons of, of, of stuff like that. I think I tried to reach for that when I was doing uh, Synthesis, which is a first contact story about uh, the USS Titan meeting a civilization that's composed primarily com completely of artificial intelligences. Um, so, and, and that to me is very much a, you know, that's a, that's a, a true science fiction idea because you, know, you get the question of what, you know, what's life? Is if something's an AI? Is it as equally valid as like organic life? And I, and I also wanted to play with the Star Trek always sees, sees itself as very much a kind of inclusive universe. And the thing about the Titan, the theme for that show, ship is. Uh, it's the most species diverse vessel in Starfleet. And of course, in a novel, we can do that because we don't have to worry about special effects budget. Mm -hmm. So we can have methane breathers and cetaceans and giant cockroach people, you know, wandering around a ship doesn't cost us any more money. And when I got the outline for the, the, the series, I thought, well, hang on a minute, they aren't actually inclusive of everybody because what's missing is any artificial life. So I wanted to write a story where they meet a bunch of AIs and the AIs say, well, you're not that inclusive, are you? Because you haven't got one of us. <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, it kind of plays off that way. So I think Star Trek's always been, rather than sort of something that reaches for a hard SF background, it's more of the sort of science fiction of ideas and concepts. But uh, the great thing about it, as I've said this yesterday, is a very broad church. And there's, there's a, Star Trek's a very elastic um, sort of way of telling stories. And you can fit a lot of different kinds of themes in there. So I always say that there's a Star Trek story out there for every science fiction fan. You just need to find it. And I, yeah, I completely agree, and I think that the sort of stable of writers that we've got at the moment, you've got like Chris Bennett is leaning more to hard SF, you're great on military SF, we've got space opera writers, I'm much more a sort of uh, soft, I'm, I'm a sociologist as a, in, is my background, so I do a lot more that's about sort of um, world building and social culture building, science. social science fiction, yeah, 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 so it's a, like you say, broad church, and I think we've got authors who are sort of good at different things. In the forward, you must take the top all of the yeah, you, and, and that would be, Chris Bennett didn't do one of those, but um, the authors are David R. George, um, who's, uh, he's, he's very good at some world building, he's working with the DS9 uh, universe at the moment. Us two, you've got Dave Mack, who's uh, great at sort of epic uh, space opera, and Dayton as well, who's, uh, he's, he wasn't he a Marine, Dayton? Yeah, Dayton. Yeah, 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 so he's sort of military SF. Yeah, and, uh, with, with the five books in the four, you've got like, so the first one, Revelation and Dust, is... Um, it's very high concept, yeah, sort of. It's, 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 very, it's very cerebral, quite dense story. And then you've got um, Crypt and Shadow afterwards, which is this sort of political thriller about sort of social aspects, and it's, yeah, it's, it's more a, about cultural yeah, it's kind of thing. Yeah, it's a detective story as well, as well. murder mystery. Yeah, yeah, so you've got that kind of, you know, uh, seeing all the different strata of this culture. And then uh, there's Dave Max. Ceremony of Losses. Is, Ceremony is, of Losses. Is Ceremony of Losses. And Dave's one is kind of like this sort of epic political thriller. Um, it's uh, me with Poison Chalice, which is much more of a sort of action adventure story, and then uh, Dayton comes at the end with Peace of All Kingdoms, which is sort of wrapping it all up and again going back to the sort of political thriller kind of thing. So it kind of covers a lot of stuff. Mm. Yeah. So looking at your writing in general, any of the stories you've 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 written, from your very first stories to where your writing is now, what changes have you seen in yourself and? How has that how how has that made you a better writer? Do you think? I have become more awesome. <laughs> um, the, 
the thing I, I said this yesterday when someone was asking about um, advice for writing, and I always said the advice I always give is finish it. And I, I, I truly believe that every story you finish writing, it's like earning XP in a game. You know, you level up every time you finish a thing. And I look back at my early work and I think, well, that's good, but I know I'm a better writer now. And I feel like every time I complete something, it's I've moved a piece further down the board. I've, you know, I've, I've made a, a, a progressive step, and I think it, it, I'm, a, I'm a better writer than, than I was before. Because I, I always say writing's like a muscle. You know, the more you exercise it, the better you get. If you don't exercise it, it gets flabby. And I think that um, I, I like to think that every piece of work I do is is, is, is great, and I'm, I'm pleased with, with everything I've, I've done. And when someone says to me, what's the best thing you've ever written? I always say, the next thing. Because I feel like I'm always constantly improving. And I love the journey of it. I love the sort of striving to just tell better and better and more fun stories. No, I'd agree. Is, is there a thing about how you have to put a, a million hours in? Before, is it that before you before you become a sort of uh, e expert level? Yeah. Uh, and I think you, it's like any, uh, you know, if I was, uh, if I was marathon running, I'd, I'd be good at it by now. Um, I don't, it's, well the muscle, <laughs> it's a different set of muscles I'm exercising, I think, so too much sitting at the computer, so it's putting the hours in and, and getting it done. I think the big change in my life is that I had a baby 16 months ago, so now I'm a lot more time focused, so I, I really appreciate the time that I've got to write, and it's, a, I, I, I say this to, I teach writing, I say this to, oh, I just can't get things down on the page, you've just got to sit down, focus, put the time in, and it slowly it builds up and you, you find you've got a book at the end of it. So uh, so putting in the hours, I think, yeah. Any more questions at all? Thank you. So following on from that a bit, what's the actual process you go through of actually writing a book? Once you've had the idea, you've got the commission of sitting down and actually doing it and finishing it. <laughs> Do you want uh, the, the magic answer? Um, I see how many words I've been contracted to write, yeah, which is usually between 60,000 and 80,000. I divide that by three, because I, I work on a kind of three act, uh, the basic structure of storytelling is a kind of three act structure. You've got exposition, you've got complication, you've got resolution, it's kind of rising wave. So I have a three acts, I get my, I decide how many chapters I'm going to have in an act, it's usually uh, four, so I've got 12 chapters overall. I divide my word count by 12, so I know how many words each chapter, and then I sit down and I write them. <laughs> and what I do is, I, the out, we have to write outlines to be commissioned, so you're usually, the outline you have to write is usually about 5,000 words long. So I go back to the outline and I break that down into where the chapters are going to be. So it's a really, I think people sort of think that you have to sit and be, you know, the muse descends and a flash of inspiration. And actually what you need to do is be, with any big task, this is true of anything in life, you break it down into tiny, tiny parts until you've got something that you can do in the next hour and a half. And then you take that off. And then the next hour and a half. And then you take that off. And by the end of two months, three months, you have 75,000 words of novel. Mm. And then you sit down and you go through, that's rubbish, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. <laughs> keep that, keep that. And it's that, it really is sitting down and doing it word by word and scene by scene, I think. Good planning. I'm just trying to think, should, should I give you the honest, I'll give you the honest answer, which is mostly staring at a blank screen going, ah! <laughs> just go! just yeah, staring at a blank, staring at the blinking cursor until your head bleeds. Uh, there is a bit of that to it. Uh, yeah, Una's right, it's, it's mostly it's about planning. You know, you, you, you need to have a storyline that you've got in your head from front to back. It doesn't matter if it changes along the way, but you have to have at least a vague roadmap. Um, I don't do it quite the same way as you. It's a little, quite it, it's, it, it, any, any writer will have a different process. And the thing is, 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 there's no right or wrong answer to it. It's like whatever works for you is what works for you, and that should be the way you do it. With me, I tend to write chapters that are roughly five to 6,000 words. So I look at my word count, and I break that up into how many chapters I think it's going to be, and I'm usually quite close to it, because I've done this long enough now that I've got a vague idea of how, how big or, or small the story should be. And I just start writing. Um, and some people will bounce around, and like they'll, they'll go and write bits later on, and they'll write earlier bits, and they'll bounce around their timeline. I can't really do that, I have to do it in a linear fashion. And sometimes, some days it's hard, and, and some days it's easy. You know, people will say to me, you know, what, what do you do about writer's block? And I say, there's no such thing as writer's block, because you know, your dentist doesn't get dentist's block, your plumber doesn't get plumber's block. Right? 
what we do for a living, although it is an art, it's also a craft. So there are days when I wake up and I think, oh, it's just not working, you know, brain no worky, and I just try really, really hard and I write something and it's you've garbage. Got to turn up for work. You've got to, you've got to be there. You know, half the job is just, you know, is doing it. I think it's uh, Brian Clements. He yeah. said, uh, "There's no secret to it. Ask in chair, hands on keyboard." And yeah. and I agree that that's, that's true. You know, some days it's easier than others, and some days I go back to work. Every every day I write something. The following day I'll go back and I'll edit what I did the day before. And and if I throw away half of it, then I throw away half of it. But the the important thing is this, is the process is still ongoing, because it doesn't count if the story's in your head. Doesn't matter how good it is in your head if it's not on the paper. It's not there. You can't you can't work it if it isn't there. And I think it's that ongoing process of just, so even if it's really, really hard work and you feel like you're chewing on a piece of granite, just little by little grinding your way through the story. And then other times there are, there are days when you know, you're writing a scene that you're really enjoying and the words just flow and it feels like the characters are possessing you and you're not even, you're just a conduit for story. And those are the best days of all, you know. It's, um, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a working process in as much as any other job is a working process. Una talked about the, the muse and some people say, oh, I have to wait for the muse to